The year is 1986. It's the middle of the night on a dirt road south of the Mexican border, about 600 miles south. My dad, Kent Dana, is driving a rented Chevy Celebrity towards the town of Esmeralda, Mexico. They're on assignment for a story about immigrants. Kent's trusted producer, Bert Sass, is in the passenger seat. Photojournalist Gary Stafford in the back. Now, nothing is going right. A rainstorm is pounding outside. They are lost. Every now and then, this little car plunges into flooded washes. Their shoes get soaking wet. They consider turning around, but risk getting lost, or worse, hitting deeper washes. In what may or may not have been an attempt at dark humor, Gary turns on his audio recorder so everyone in the car can give final messages to families just in case. Now, before I tell you the rest of this story, I want to point out that my father loved what we call in the news business a good tease. So I'll get back to that road in Mexico at midnight in a moment. A few decades earlier, on the morning of January 20th, 1942, Joseph Kent Dana was born. His mother, Dora, would of course love all seven of her children. Kent was number three. But Kent would give mom reason to beam, to brag. There was something about this boy. At five, Kent won the Mr. Little Arizona pageant at the Orpheum Theater. He joined local plays. One newspaper writer, assessing the 12-year-old actor's role, wrote, Young Kent Dana stole the show. As the Dana clan grew to seven kids, they were inseparable in their midtown Phoenix neighborhood just off Central. They rode bikes, climbed trees, hit the swimming pool at Encano Park. Now, Kent wasn't real athletic and used to tell the story of the year he tried playing Little League Baseball. I can still hear his voice. One game, I finally got a hit, he would say. I was so ecstatic, I promptly ran to third base. As Kent's younger sisters were born, the family needed more space. This is a family of nine with a house of three rooms. So they made the carport into one room, and they moved Reed and Kent into a standalone garage. As teenagers, their room was a garage. It sounds rough, but keep in mind, my grandfather Joe, a radio broadcaster, was in the communications business. Words can reframe reality. The garage would forever be referred to as the den. Kent and Reed once raised pigeons in the backyard, eventually letting them free. It's not out of the realm of possibility that future news stories my dad covered about Phoenix pigeon nuisance laws could possibly be traced back to that backyard on Edgemont Street next to a very classy den. Kent learned early to work. As a kid, he sold donuts to neighbors, shared a paper route with his brother, and laid bricks in the Arcadia neighborhood and at Christown Mall. One year, Kent made trips to the White Mountains with his father to build a cabin, even during brutal, snowy winter months. The Greer cabin would become the family's Eden. The Dana kids wandered for hours in the forest and streams, and if you can picture it, with used syrup bottles that their mother, Dora, had saved for them that were filled with water strapped to their waists. The Greer story, normally told in hushed tones, is when Kent and two friends got bored. They decided to walk into the woods and light pine cones on fire. A bush caught fire and it spread. People in the area whacked the fire with gunny sacks, but it grew across a hillside. Firefighters and the Forest Service were called in and eventually put it out. My father's oldest sister, Carol, has a journal entry from that day. It contains exactly one sentence. Today, we went to church in Greer, and the boys started a forest fire. <laughs> Kent was a romantic. On the side of an aspen tree in a grove in Greer, you still may be able to see the faint carving of a heart with the initials inside reading KD plus CB. The girl with the initials CB was Kent's high school sweetheart. At 19, Kent used more than $2,000 he had saved up to pay for a two and a half year mission to Uruguay. Though not religious later in life, my dad always said he had no regrets about going. 
He learned about rejection, cultural differences, and sacrifice. While a student at BYU in Provo, Utah, Kent met his first wife, Carol Ann Huber from Mesa. During their 12-year marriage, they would have four children. I would be the fourth. I arrived just in the nick of time, I am told. Those 12 years raising a young family involved fits and starts for Kent as he tried to find his place. He did not just waltz on a stage like when he was five years old and get a prize. While he was taking college courses, he bought a radio station. It lost money. He started a house renovation and rental company called Houses Unlimited. Houses Unlimited was just two houses, and profits were very limited. <laughs> he tried an apprenticeship program at an oil and gas company. He quit after a week. He invested in two gas stations, but gas was dirt cheap during this era. He's probably somewhere smiling right now at the irony of this and he was forced to bail out of the gas station business. But Kent also had what today his grandkids would refer to as a side hustle. He used his broadcasting degree to do overnight radio news on weekends for minimum wage. That turned into a weekend anchoring gig for Cool TV. It was 1976. He could afford to buy one new sport coat for his anchoring job. He went to Sears, and bought that coat. The rest is history. Many people don't realize what became of the traditional Christmas jacket was actually meant to be taken seriously at one time. My dad swears, and maybe it was just for a few minutes, he swears that that was once in style. The jacket is a symbol for one of Kent's best traits. Mark moments in life with good humor. Make traditions, no matter how tacky. In 1979, a talent feeding frenzy in the TV news business changed everything. 12 News wanted to go big. They stole from the competition helicopter pilot Jerry Foster, sports reporter Bill Denny, and the up-and-coming Kent Dana. There was another turning point in Kent's life. He was at an apartment after a night out with friends when in walked a tall blonde from Iowa. A roommate. Kent noticed her long legs and white shorts and later said she had the hottest tan in town. <laughs> she, she, Janet, did not recognize Kent from the news, which made Kent more intrigued and determined. For her part, Janet says Kent's easy manner and charm were irresistible. He was unselfish and just helpful to anyone. And she loved that he could just blend into a crowd. One of Kent's former co-workers describes this trait this way. She said, Kent made me feel like I was the most hilarious person in the world, and I'm not even that funny. <laughs> On that night in that apartment, Kent and Janet talked for hours and learned that they shared the same birth date, a sign of destiny for Kent. They were soon married. Kelly and Carrie, my two younger sisters, were born. The six of us over the years have loved and laughed together. It's also worth noting that through divorce and my dad's remarriage, Kent, Janet, and my mother taught us children about civility and family. Kent and my mom were a team in parenting, and they both always spoke respectfully about each other. All right, now back to that dirt road in Mexico. From the back seat, Gary pointed his microphone towards Kent and Burke. We are not doing last messages, they concluded. That would just be a bad omen. Attempting to lighten the mood, Gary pointed the microphone at Bert. Now, if you know Bert, he has the best intentions, always, and is the nicest man you will ever meet. He points the mic at Bert, who was in charge of planning all of the logistics of this trip, and he says, now, Bert, is it true that we could have flown to Esmeralda for $50? He turns to Kent, who Bert saw was clenching the steering wheel tight, his knuckles white, and says, and Kent, how are you feeling about all this? Now, I can't tell you my dad's response word for word because from what I understand, nearly every word was an expletive. And as Bert tells it, that was the only time he ever saw the easygoing Kent appear to just lose it. They reached Esmeralda. After meeting the family who was the centerpiece of their story, Kent, who was the only one who 
spoke Spanish of the three, quickly made this family feel at ease, and they were smiling and laughing. Bert saw the old Kent he loved quickly return. Over three decades, my father's adventure as a TV news anchor in his hometown, a town that grew up and matured along with him, was an experience that, for him, I can compare to a sort of amusement ride. Ratings were sky high, local TV news dominated, and 12 News was usually on top. Kent just enjoyed the ride. A generation of Arizonans grew up watching Kent Dana. And my dad had to meet strangers, had the chance to meet strangers everywhere he went, and it just seemed the novelty of it never wore off for him. He covered the hard stories, the political conventions, the crime, wildfires, the impeachment of a governor, the experience that hit him hardest was spending five days at the site of the Oklahoma City bombing because, as he put it, he saw up close how hate destroys. But he appreciated just as much the features. The 93, 94 Suns had that citywide parade, if you remember, and it was brutally hot in July. My dad and photographer went to a convenience store and they noticed a Phoenix police officer who was on a break conspicuously lingering inside the walk-in beer cooler. He admitted to them he was desperate just to cool off. Well, that was his mistake. Telling this to the news guys, well, you know what happened next. Within seconds, the photographer grabbed his camera and rolled on the officer while he stood there in the beer, beer cooler. Now, many years later, that officer told me, after his appearance on the 10 o'clock news that night, he had a new nickname at the PD for the rest of his career, Freezer. <laughs> My father loved the way local news connected the community, provided a public square for debate, and became a stage for the stories of our lives. His proudest projects were Silent Witness and Wednesday's Child Profiles that drew attention to adoption and foster care. One viewer says, he watched a Wednesday's child story one night. He cried, he talked to his wife. Together, they ended up fostering 19 children and adopting three. A Mesa woman approached me at a fundraiser a few years back. If it wasn't for Kent Dana, she said, I wouldn't have my five children. Does my stepmother know about this? I asked her. <laughs> One Wednesday's child trip involved taking a group of foster children to Disneyland. My dad figured out a loophole in the system. A photographer was filming the kids on each ride, and when a ride ended, my dad, sensing that the kids loved it so much, would turn to the Disneyland operator and say, you know, I just don't think we got all the footage we needed. Can we, can we get another one? The kids would immediately go again. How about a third take? and so on. He was a kid at heart. You'll hear more from people who love my father about why he was so special to them. And as for me, I'll remember most. A Saturday, that my dad and I built a skateboard launch ramp together. I'll remember a work of art I did that he, without me knowing, took to a framing company to have framed. I remember him taking me hours early to spring training baseball games just so my cousin Robert and I could get autographs. I don't know if anyone spent so much time sitting in a seat in a baseball stadium without a game actually going on. My dad was so patient. He knew we were having a good time, and that's what mattered. And I'll remember the day I was a high school senior, tagging along with him at the O.J. Simpson trial. By luck, I had gained access into the courtroom while my dad was outside in the parking lot. Cameras were cut off from the courtroom that day, and I frantically ran to him after the day ended with details of what happened. It was minutes until air. Why don't you just go live on air with me and we'll do the report together, he said. He thought it would just be fun. I thought he was a little crazy. A dad here 
in this moment was showing unflinching confidence in his son. And that's what I'll remember. During the last day of my dad's life, he was surrounded by three of my sisters and stepmother. And something happened in that final half hour of his passing that I think was fitting. And I know he would appreciate, given this unique, adventurous life that he lived in the spotlight. A nurse was starting her shift and going through the motions of introducing herself. She then recognized my dad's name and face. She couldn't believe who she was tending to. In a way, she was representing all those viewers who felt that they had this connection to Kent Dana, even if they never met him. Those who invited him into their living rooms and watched Mr. Little Arizona give them the news of the day, the good, the bad, and the amusing. In a way, they were all represented in that final half hour of his life. I grew up watching your dad, the nurse said, with tears in her eyes. She sat down with my sisters and stepmom, and they all comforted him together. 